welcome to class. Uh, we are now well into the reader and are moving on to a very interesting example of a personal reflection of ethical leadership. Uh, the homework assignment for today was merely to, can we start giving warnings and kicking people out? Uh, the homework assignment for today was merely to read the speech. You have no class on Tuesday, so you have until next Thursday to finish the chapter, which is the analysis, where we'll be going into the way this spe speech is broken down by an author who attempts to use this then as a model for all different types of ethical leaders. So, which theories have we had so far? We're now, we're now moving into the area of theory. So which theories have we had so far that you could use to uh, assess things? Which, which state the theory or its author, the person who's known as its um, creator or Barnabe? No, that, that's an example of ethical leadership. No, uh, theories. What is the? Th okay, okay. Let's let's wait a second, and uh, I'm I'm hoping to be able to kick out at least six students in this uh, first month of class. So keep on talking, and we'll collect a couple of cases. Thank you. Uh, what is a theory? Before we, maybe that's the, this, the reason for the confusion. What is a theory? An uh, is a hypothesis enough to make up a theory? No. 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 A hypothesis. Uh, and a theory is a set of ideas which leads us, or gives us the ability to develop hypotheses and also the ability to test them. They can, be test, they can be tested empirically, or they can be ex tested through abstract reasoning. But the larger, the larger context is that you have a set of ideas that leads you to operationalization of actual cases. So which theories have we had so far? Legal Franco Bernabe is not a theory. Legal okay. Lawrence Kohlberg, the theory of pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional post ethics. It's referred to as the Kohlbergian model. So you just take Kohlberg and put an Ian. Ian, which does not make him Armenian, right? That's a joke. OK. Uh, so the Kohlbergian model. We mentioned that he was being criticized. And we don't have an uh, eraser here. Oh, there it is, the floor. Okay, out of camera, okay. Uh, we mentioned that he was criticized. So Col Colbergian ethics and the Colbergian approach, Colbergian, what would be somebody who tried to develop his theory further, who wanted to go beyond Colberg? We'll be dealing with post Kohlbergian. Now, just, just so you're thinking about this, what is the major criticism of Kohlberg's theory? What does he assume you have to do when you're developing in your ethical trajectory? That you can't go back. Let's try to take this, uh, this question and apply it now to Hammerskjold's thinking. Can you backslide? Now think about it personally. If somebody has, a reach, has reached a relatively high level of ethical thinking and behavior, can they 
go back and start becoming, uh, becoming unethical again. Yes. That's our experience. So this would be one major criticism. What, what is assumed is that Kohlberg has a, a staircase approach. Let's see, does Hammerskjold agree with the staircase? Or does he, uh, does he think that basically we're always under threat of reverting back, backsliding? So keep that in mind. Uh, what else does Kohlberg do? How does he get his data? He does, he does interviews. He does open-ended interviews. What's the difference? Can someone tell me the difference between an open-ended and a closed-ended question? Yes. Or, or how old are you? How old are you? I don't give options, but I can say how old are you? You write your age. That's it. There's no going on after that. Whereas open-ended is you have to talk and talk and talk. We, I gave you the example, a very, very open-ended question. Question one, do you have a foreign passport? Question two, is it from the West? Question three, what would have to change in Lebanon? for you to be willing to live with just the Lebanese passport and give up your Canadian passport or give up your Australian passport. What would have to happen? It's obviously not an en a closed-ended question. Different people would respond differently. And a lot of people would go, whoa, uh, I never thought of that question before. I mean, and then you start actually fantasizing about your perfect country. Okay, so let's have a look now at Hammerskjold. Hammerskjold, what are some of the elements of his character and his experience? First of all, let's, one of the things that we're going to be doing is looking at the biography of our thinkers. Where do they come from? And what the speech does not reveal, but what the article will reveal, is his background. So we established this already. What are the inputs into making up the man, Dag Hammarskjöld? Okay, he's from Sweden. And besides IKEA, if you know that company, what do you associate with Sweden? Fish. Okay, what else? Girls. Oh, yeah, well, Sweden and Scandinavia in general uh, used to be associated with uh, hanky panky, if you will. Uh, that's, that's disappeared because of the internet, right? Okay. Volvo. Okay. What do we know about Volvo and Saab? Very, very high quality. <laughs> Basically, when you, you can buy a Saab for life or a Volvo for life. So they're very well made. So what does that tell you about the, if you could base your assumption of Swedish society on those two cars, what would you assume about Swedish society? Hardworking, reliable, honest, consistent. When they say something, that's what they mean. They deliver, they follow up. When you buy a Volvo or a Saab, they will be there for you for the rest of the life of the car. It's not like take the car and get lost. So if we have to dif differentiate between the two approaches to the way we deal with rules, what did we say the two are? When you have rules, there's two approaches. Rule of law or culture of impunity. Now, it does make a huge difference whether you grow up in a, in a culture that is primarily based on rule of law. Of course, no, no country is honest. Human beings are constantly tempted to be dishonest, and that's why you have criminal records and criminal offense statistics in countries like Sweden. It's, it continues to happen. So Sweden, rule of law. If there's a high level of rule of law, what, where does that feed into the Kohlbergian ethics? If there's a high level of being rewarded for good things and punished for bad things, what impact would ha that have on Kohlberg's theory? 
conventional ethics. It, it has a huge impact on conventional socialization. Conventional socialization means that you are trained by society, which is a composite. It's made up of the different parts, which is, of course, family, education, workplace, politics, NGOs, whatever, that your experience as you grow up and become a human being is that there's going to be rule of law. You do good things, you'll be rewarded. You do bad things, you'll be punished. So if you grow up in a society with a high level of culture of impunity, what does that do to your experience with conventional ethics, at the very least? What do you think of conventional ethics if your experience is, as a rule, that nobody's punished for doing things wrong and you're rarely rewarded for doing things right? It's just words. It's just words. So your, your, your level of conventional socialization will be very low. What could that actually lead us to? If, you're in a, if you grew up in a climate uh, with very little conventional socialization, what might you be tempted to do? You, there's two things you can probably, you'll probably do. You could say, well, the law, nobody's obeying the law, so why should I? And you just think out about yourself and nobody else. What if you're actually a person who doesn't, who doesn't like that? What would you be tempted to do? Or what would, your, your, what would there be a high tendency to do? To move beyond the conventional to post-conventional. Now this is very important. We'll, we'll see this as we go through the different readings. There's a huge difference between conventional, post-conventional ethics and the socialization of the two on the national or sub-national level and the supernatural. Supranational level, supranational level. What is the, what does it mean, national level? On the, uh, the country, the nation state, Lebanon, Egypt, Canada, Australia. On that level, or the, most countries are broken down into what? Below the national level you have? Regional, Regional governments. This is the one thing that's obviously missing in Lebanon. There's no muhafasa or no district or state or provincial governments. There's just national. And local, the municipalities, which are now directly elected. So that's actually a, an interesting level of administration. We see that now, for example, working really well with the refugee crisis. It's the local governments that are doing the work, not the national government. So the local governments are actually there and they actually do things, sometimes very professionally. So national, state, and local. So on those three levels, we have rules. We have socialization, or we don't. But in the case of Sweden, what do we have? We have it. It's rule of law. OK. When Dag Hammarskjöld moves from the national level to the international level, level what does he experience as far as this is concerned? He, can, he experiences two things. One is there are countries that have a different set of rules that are in conflict with my own. But what else does he experience? It's something more important. What does not exist, or what is not very well <coughs> established on the international level? Rules. Rules, conventions. There's very little international conventional socialization. Some of you have heard of the World Trade Organization. What does the World Trade Organization do? It regulates the laws. No, that's the mistake. It does not regulate anything. It deregulates. The whole purpose of the World Trade Organization is to remove rules, not to add them. So what we're missing on the global level is any attempt of a regulatory body. Uh, and, and, and one thing is to have rules, and the second thing is to enforce them. Because the root of enforce is force which means, for example, uh, I mean, a lot of you are very cynical. That means you think, well, the rules are there, but nobody's going to obey. And we see this now, for example, with the Crimea. 
what is the major criticism of the US and the EU with respect to their approach to Putin? What, what's the response? Why are you enforcing the law all of a sudden? Why all of a sudden, right? Why not before? Why did not somebody say, well, we should arrest George W. Bush and send him to jail for invading Iraq? So if Bush can do it, why can't Putin? So what we're seeing here is very, if any, very selective enforcement, which leads to, of course, very low levels of expectation as far as conventional ethics. Basically, it's a culture of impunity because some people can get away with it and others can't, which doesn't mean it's an actual system of rule and law, of law. It's arbitrary. It's up to the people in charge to decide one way or the other. Okay, so Sweden. So he grows up in Sweden. Some of you have been, to, a lot of you have been to Europe, but not that many people go to Scandinavia. One reason it's really expensive, then it's very far away, and the weather isn't that nice. But it's very interesting, like Norway's very attractive because of the fjords. People like to go on those ships down the, along the coast. Okay, Sweden, what else do we know about him? What, what goes into making up the man, besides his origin in Sweden? Religion, he's Protestant, and he's very, what we call, faith. So this is a, a very modern term. It's not going to be in the readings. It's a modern term, faith-based, which means that he justifies his decisions and his thinking and his approach to life based on his Christian faith. And not only Christian, but Protestant, which which is a little bit different. We can talk about that a little bit if you're interested. The Protestant faith traditions as opposed to the Catholic and the Orthodox. What else do we know about him? Was he active in politics? Yes. yes. He was a member of the Social Democratic Party which is rooted in Marxism. So some people, would, some people said last class, well, that's not possible. You can't be Christian and Marxist at the same time. And other people said, yes, you can. So we'll have a, we'll have a look at that. And finally, what do we know about him? I, OK, he was the second. Before he became Secretary General of the UN, what was his day job? Where, where, did, where did he work? In the, yeah, he worked for which organization? Swedish Government Service. By the way, does anybody actually go on Wiki, go to Google and actually look at these people up? By the way, did I mention that you can use Wikipedia? I mentioned that already? Okay, good. So I'll, I'll spare the uh, insults for the people who say you can't, OK? Because this is being taped. So we know four things about him that are very, very important. And he's going to talk about this now as in his speech. He's got a Swedish background, which is strongly rooted in rule of law. He's got a strong sense of personal religious faith. He has a social democratic background, social democratic party well known for being interested in caring for the underdog, for the working class, for the people who don't have a lot of money and influence. And finally, his government service enforces what we already know, namely rule of law. He has a strong conventional socialization experience. OK, now we move on, we move on to the international level. And we have two levels of confrontation here. We'll, let's have a look now at the, at the speech. Can you turn to your readers? So what I'm going to do today, uh, we tried having sort of discussion here and there, and that turned, to be, turned out to be very distracting. What we'll do is we'll uh, have 10 minutes of discussion twice during the class. It'll be recorded, and if you can keep this in an orderly fashion, it'll be valuable for the, for the uh, online version. Uh, if not, we'll edit it out. OK. So. What is the first point he makes? Let's have, first of all, let's, he, look, look, he went to Johns Hopkins University. 
1950, oh, he didn't go there, he spoke at John Hopkins University. And he speaks here on page 22 or 73 in the, in the book about one human family. What does that mean? Obviously we're not one human family. What does he mean by that? What does that term mean? That all humans basically share some common values. If you're interested, there's something called the World Values Survey. Is it true that all humans sh share some core concepts of right and wrong, good and bad, proper and improper? Or is it, that would be a strong argument for which approach? If the universalist approach. Or you believe, no, that's not true. In certain parts of the world, people think completely different in, 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 on issues like uh, justice or freedom, so that we would have a regional distinction between different areas. That would be which approach? Relativist. The relativist approach, depending on the circumstances, uh, the sh shift. So what the World Values Survey attempted to establish, and you can Google it, is this started off, actually, I'll give you a little bit of background. When the European Union was founded, does anybody know the history of the EU? Yeah, which, which countries were the first six members? Uh, France, uh, France, Germany. Uh, France, Germany. Uh, Italy. Uh, Italy. Uh, and, uh, and three small countries that go by the name Benelux. Ben, Belgium. Ne Netherlands, Lux, Luxembourg. So the three Benelux countries, Belgium, ne Netherlands, and Luxembourg, Germany, France, and Italy. And they, had, they were relatively homogeneous. That means that their culture was relatively similar. Uh, what happens in the 70s is you have some countries joining that had been fascist or had had military dictatorships for decades, which was Spain, Portugal, and Greece. And what the European Union wanted to know is, do these countries share the same values after many, many decades of fascism and military dictatorship that we do? Or are they culturally and ethically different? Are their values now different because of their fascist or military uh, authoritarian uh, uh, experience? Because we're talking here about two, two to three generations, right? So what did they find out? Yes, the values are relatively similar despite the experience of many years of oppression. Then we have in the 90s another wave of expansion. Who joins now? Who had a very long history of oppression? Which countries? The, the former communist countries. So they, they want to find out, are, are people from Poland somehow different? Are, they're joining the EU. Are people from uh, Romania or from Lithuania somehow different? What they find out is the answer is no. In the core values, they're the same. So they, this, this was actually called the European Values Survey. So what is the next step to find out? What would, what would you now want to know? If decades of fascism or decades of communism don't stop us from being human, it is it's not genetic, obviously, yeah. we, could, we could apply this approach to the entire yeah. world. This is what's meant by the human family, that Ultimately, there are core values of freedom and fairness that we share worldwide. So, uh, this, is what, this is what the statement means. So let's turn to the page, the next, the next uh, part of the speech. Here, he's talking at the very top about international service. And this is where it becomes very interesting because if you're going to be working on the international level, He immediately asks, is it possible to maintain your personal ethics which you developed on the national level when you're doing international service? Or should you give up what you were up until now and try to fit in on the global level? So, I'm reading the second paragraph. Is it not, you might ask, paradoxical? What does paradoxical mean? Contradictory to strive for truly international service in a divided world. Later on he asks, 
And what about your personal convictions? So we're dealing here with two levels. One, international versus personal, which is always national. Or in some cases, subnational. If you go to France, people throughout the country share some common understandings of what it means to be French. France is a t classical example of modern national thinking. But in Lebanon, is Lebanon a nation? No. no. Even for those who would like Lebanon to be a nation, is it a nation today? No. Does anybody want to give it a try? Why is it a nation? Thank you. It's a nation because the government, people, land, all these components. Okay, we have to define, define nation. Switzerland, is it a nation? So what I, what I always like to do is I, I have, a, I'm going to pass some money around and you're not allowed to keep it, right? Okay, first of all, I'm, I'm going to hand, around, hand out something totally worthless, which is a Belgian franc bill. It has three languages, if you can find them. German, Belgium, Belgian. We know it's French and, and Dutch, but also German. There's a small minority of German speakers, so they put German on the bill which would mean in Lebanon, you'd have to put Armenian on the bill. Right. Second of all, I'm going to pass a, a bill around. Now, this one's actually worth something. Uh, the French franc is now more than a dollar, so I do want this back, right? Uh, can you go and take it over the, there and let it go around? Here we have four languages. Which languages do they speak in, Belgi in uh, Belgium? Dutch, French, German. What do they speak in Switzerland? German, French. Italian, then why are there four languages? What's the fourth language? Dutch. Why Dutch? <laughs> the language is call, called Romanche. It's a very small language minority, but still, it's on the money. So all four languages are respected. So not all countries have a common national understanding, but Switzerland does. Despite the fact that it has four different languages and two major confessions, Catholics and Protestants, and believe me, the Swiss used to be as good as the Lebanese, or as bad as the Lebanese, depending how you want to put it, they used to go to war with each other over religion. That stopped 150 years ago, that's not that long. So who wants to be the first person to be exmatriculated from this class? Do we have any volunteers so we can just get it over with? Who wants a UW? Guys, who wants a UW? You're not fessing up. So tell me. I hear, I hear people talking. Is that the person who wants the UW? No. OK, good. Uh, so personal is either national or subnational. So he's talking about the conflict between national, international service and your personal values. But he's also talking about a divided world. What was the world divided along which lines? What was splitting the world in two at the time of this speech? In 1955, there were two worlds. What were they? The communist, Soviet-dominated, and the Western, Western uh, capitalist, democratic, if you will, world dominated by the United States. So we talked about this in the last class. So how can you work as a global leader? We'll have a whole chapter at the very end on global ethics. How can you work as a, a global leader when the world's divided in two, two major camps? So, this is the question he poses, and what is his answer? He writes, my reply, he's asking, can you maintain your, is it a contradiction, is it paradoxical, to maintain your personal ethics, which are national or subnational, in a divided world? Is, is it a contradiction? He says, 
My reply to these skeptical questions is no. Are you following? International service requires of all of us, first and foremost, the courage to be yourself. Now, isn't that a contradiction? If I'm going to be myself, what am I going to insist on? My values, which are personal and national. So how's this going to work? So he continues. In other words, it requires that we should be true to none other than the, our, our ideals and interests, but these should be such as can be carefully endorsed after having open mind, opened our minds with great honesty to the many voices of the world. This is a method. So pay attention. This is a method that he's proposing that you try. What you should do is take your personal goals, personal values, your personal understanding of right and wrong. This is his. Now you can do this exercise with yourself. What is your, what, what does it mean to have grown up in Lebanon? Or what does it mean to be Lebanese and having grown up in Saudi Arabia? What does it mean to be Lebanese and have grown up in the Netherlands? Or whatever. So what is your socialization like? Think about it. Don't tell anybody. Just think about it. What influence does your personal faith or lack thereof? There are By the way, do you need religion to be ethical? So what about, what about Aristotle and Socrates? Aristotle's famous for his book, Ethics. Did he base it on religion? No. You can base your ethics on rational thinking, or you can base it on divine revelation, or you can, you can base it on both. So, but think about it. Your background, whether it's religious or non-religious, what role does it play in establishing the way you act in the world? Thirdly, a lot of you are <clears throat> somehow tied to a political movement, somehow. Uh, I notice that when I bring up certain issues, people respond spontaneously in a positive or negative way. So your political experience, your party's experience, the background that you've brought from your own family and that you've established by your own personal activities. And finally, have you had any work experience or any experience in NGOs? How has that uh, affected you? We did a survey about five years ago in the business and engineering faculties, and what we found out is that the students, as they go through NDU, every year they become less and less ethical. <laughs> By the time they graduate, their ethics is in the basement. Now, the professors were not very happy with these results, and we wanted to make them feel somehow better about themselves. We said, we have no way of knowing whether it was NDU that did it to the students, or whether it was just growing up it wasn't NDU. It could, it could have been that if, it ha if they hadn't been at NDU, they would be worse. It was actually NDU that was slowing down the process of becoming bad. <laughs> Why? I don't know. You, you could, you couldn't, right? So, good. So what he's saying is there is no contradiction. But how do you go about it? The first thing is you take your set of ethics and now you confront your set of ethics with those of other people. For example, most of you are going to do this. Some of you have already done it. You've been in a context, you've been in a group setting with people whose thinking is completely different to yours. If you grew up abroad, it already happened to you. If you live in Lebanon, it can happen to you all the time. I'm amazed sometimes, I live in LA, which means I live primarily in what kind of town? Druze although I'm Protestant. But, so, I, I have a Protestant background, I live in a Druze town, I work a lot with Armenians on various projects, you know what, next year's a big year, right, for the Armenians, the 100th anniversary of the genocide, or commemoration of the genocide. So I, I, know, I know a lot of Sunnis, I know a lot of Shia. <laughs> what I've noticed is, is that in Lebanon, a lot of people don't know much about the other groups. So what is the first thing you would want to do if you were going to use his approach? 
Go and confront your set of, th th of, of assumptions with another group. For example, uh, I teach a research, research methods class and we go to a, a center which does a lot of research on the Civil War called Umam, which means nations. See? My Arabic's really good. Umam, all right? Sorry about that. Umam, okay. And this, and this, now everyone's laughing about my accent. Okay, good. 15, 15 seconds of laughing and then be quiet. Okay, so, where, where <laughs> five seconds, I'll, I'll say, where, where is this center located? In Harat Reik. Where's Harat Reik? Where's Harat Reik? It's in Tahia. So, what do I hear? What do I hear from a lot of my students? No way. I can't go to Dahia. You die, right? It's something you die. I don't know if that's true. Then how do the people who live in Dahia coming back and forth to NDU every day, right? I mean, they, they couldn't do that if that were true, right? So there are these assumptions about. I mean, this is usually the one of the. If you live in if you live in Kisarwain, you probably don't know much about Dahia. But I would assume that people who live in Dahia don't know that much about Kisarwain. So. Or they might know more because they study at NDU, whatever. So, what would you do? You'd, you'd intentionally confront yourself with the assumptions of the different groups in this country. I'm now working in a project with uh, refugees in Akkar, so I'm now adding another group to my repertoire. Alawites. How many of you know anything about the Alawite community? Good. Bravo, I'm glad you know everything. I'm discovering that there are big differences, because I always thought Alawites, Druze, they're probably more or less the same, right? No, no. <laughs> I didn't know the big differences. I'm starting to figure that out, right? So what you do is you confront yourself, according to Hammerskjold, with the different ways of seeing things, and what do you then try to do? What's the suggestion? You read the article. You try to find the common ground between all of the different sets of values and your own. Without giving up any of your core values, you should be able to find essential ways of doing things. And these, of course, are largely non-conventional, post-conventional, post-conventional uh, values. Okay, that's the first step. So, what does he do? This, this, this is something that you will need to be able to repeat on the test. The first step is to be aware of your set of values. The second set, step is to confront your set of values with other people's sets of values which will not be necessarily friendly to your own. Does this remind you of anybody's four steps that we talked about so far? Martin, Martin Luther King. What's the first step? Research. Research. So for Hammerskjold, the first step is to know your values. I mean, you can do this as an exercise, it's not homework, but know your values. Sit down and say, what, what went into making me who I am? The second step is to go out and confront other people with, and, and have them confront you. What's that called? You change through talk. Dia logos. Dia does not mean to, as we know. It means across or through. So through interaction, I discover things about, my, my maid was asking me today, she said, oh, I heard this about the, uh, uh, what's it called? Ak not Ak 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 in, in where the fighting was in the, Arsa, 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 yeah. And she wanted to know, Arsa, Arsa? Arsel. Arsel, Arsel. And she wanted to know, what, what is this thing with Shia and Sunnis? She wouldn't, didn't understand why one village was going after another. She's from the Philippines, so she didn't really understand the distinction. So these kinds of discussions, she said, oh, I now I understand more about the Shia, because she didn't understand what the problem was, right? She th thought all, because in the Philippines, you have something like 95% Christians and 5% Muslims, and they're Sunni. So the issue between, there's no conflict. Okay. So through talk, through interaction, we expand. So what is the next step that he follows? Let's have a look. 
on seven, at 75 at the top. If this is the essence of international service, such service will expose us to conflicts. Very important. Are conflicts good or bad? <laughs> Depends. Depends is always the, the best answer. Uh, when, it, when it's twice, then we mark it down, and at the third time, I want, I, I, I would like to throw someone out today, okay, if we can. Can we throw someone out today? Yeah, please. Okay. Okay, so the next question is this. When I come and tap you on the shoulder, the arrow is fine. Yeah, but take, t take down the name, please, okay? Okay. Good. <laughs> Conflict, is it good or bad? Who said it's bad? It's good. No, yeah. yeah. Who said it's bad? No, oh, come on, give me. I heard people say it's bad. What, why is it bad? Give me, a, give me, give it a try. Why is it bad? Okay, it could cause violence. It could cause bad feelings. It could cause a lack of productivity because people are not working. They're fighting with each other. So these are the negative aspects of conflict that we cannot focus on more important things. But what is conflict? an expression of? What is it a manifestation of, a symptom of? Different ways of seeing things. And they're legitimate. By the way, guys, we're working now on the promotion policy for this university, and we're asking ourselves, when someone becomes a full professor, which is the highest level, it's the terminal level, what should they actually do before they're promoted to this highest level? And we're having a little war here uh, between the engineers and the science faculties, on the one hand, humanities and business and political science on the other, because we think that our professors need to publish a lot. And the articles should be single authored, which means they have to publish alone. And any smart scientist knows you can't do a whole series of experiments over a long period of time alone. So we go, they go, the science professors go, what, single authored? Doesn't exist. And we go, oh, single authored is the only way to go. So now we have a fight. We were fighting it out for a couple of weeks. Is we, had a, we got to a compromise, imagine that. But are these conflicts legitimate? Of course they are. We can't force a business or political science or, or, uh, humanities. or humanities approach on the engineers or the biologists and physicists. We can't do that, it would, it would be wrong. Vice versa, the other way around, they can't force it there, so we have to find a, so these, comp these conflicts are actually useful. useful because they bring the differences to the surface. So what do we want to do with conflicts? Resolve them quickly. Bravo. Mm -hmm. Resolve them, which means what? They go away. Should they go away? Or should they keep on keeping us busy forever? They should go away. OK, guys, please write this down. Conflict resolution means we can, we can resolve them. So the conflict between, let's say, people with black skin and people with white skin, often known as racism, can that go away and never be a problem again? Could it be? But, but could it go away? Yes. Pigmentation, fortunately, Le Lebanon has a lot of different issues, but skin pigmentation is not one of them. People who have darker skin usually don't earn less money than people who have light skin. It's not an issue. I mean, we're not talking about immigrants here, we're talking about Lebanese. So pigmentation is not an issue. In many countries in the world it is. The lighter your skin, the better you are. That's why people buy Fair and Lovely. You saw the ad? She wanted a job. She couldn't get the job. So what did she do? She put on Fair and Lovely, her skin got lighter, and she got the job. What is, they sh you know what they put on cigarettes? This, this you know, tobacco kills, this, or tobacco causes cancer. They should put on Fair and Lovely, this causes racism, right? I don't know if I'm going to get in trouble if, I, if this goes online. OK. Anyway, the idea that white skin is better is something we can get over. It can disappear. We can say, okay, people's skin color or the shape of their skulls is not significant. 
So we, we, can, we can resolve racism. How about the conflict between teachers and students? How about the conflict between men and women? Do we really want the conflict between men and women to go away? Guys, it's, it's, it's amongst us guys, right? Uh, when you go out in the, <laughs> on a date, do you want that tension to go away? No. <laughs> so that's, that's, the good that's the good part, right? You know. So the other term that we have, is we, can, we can change it into something positive. Don't punch him. Don't punch him. No, no violence. Is transformation. One of the things that should always be in the back of our minds is, is that some conflicts can go away. Some conflicts can't go away, but they're unpleasant. And some conflicts we actually like and don't want them to go away. So ethics should transform the way we deal with others. So that even in the case where, for example, between a boss and the workers, your employer, basically wants you to work very few hours and make lots of money. You, on the other hand, want to work long hours and not earn much money. Yeah? No, it's the other way around, right? So this tendency is inherent. It means it's born into. It's going to always be there. This tendency is inherent in the relationship between employers and employees. It will never go away. It's often unpleasant. It's not something we say, oh, that's, so, that's wonderful that my boss wants me to work extra hours for nothing, right? The question is not whether it is pleasant or not. It's not going to go away. So if you want to resolve it, you want this conflict to be overcome, that would basically make you a communist. If you want this, pro this conflict to be transformed into something positive, that would make you either a liberal, a conservative, or a social democrat. If people wonder, what's the difference between a socialist and a communist? One of the major differences is that communists believe that the problem has to go away, which means that one side has to win. And which side is going to win based on the concept of communism? <laughs> the workers, the people who have jobs. Whereas liberals, conservatives, and socialists, social democrats, would say the problem is not going to go away. But we can transform it. We can have relationships between workers and employers that recognize the inborn conflict, but try to make it positive. So applying that to your own experience at NDU, is there a conflict between you as students and the administration and professors on the other hand? There are conflicts. One of them is we want to increase tuition. Professors would love to increase tuition, because if we can increase tuition, what can we do? We can make more money. That's basically what they are. Every time we ask for more money, the administration comes back and says, we can't pay you more, because the students don't want to pay more tuition. So basically, we, real, we realize that you are our enemies. <laughs> the administration so wants. What's the reason for the raise? <laughs> What's that? You're the reason for the tuition raise? That's what the administration would like you to believe, right? It's the, mm -hmm. it's the profe greedy professors who want more salary who are causing you to pay more tuition. These pay. conflicts will never go away. So obviously, no one's going to have a student. Oh, by the way, is, was there ever a university that was run by students? The, the guys, just a little background. I'm not going to put this on the test, but a little background. Does anybody know what the uh, European credit transfer system is? They have it, they have it at USG. What is it? Right. The European credit transfer system is a, is a, is a mechanism which gives each course a certain number of credits. So courses typically don't have three credits. They have like 11 or 15 or 9, whatever. It's, it's class time, homework, lab time, field research, whatever. Gets the number, and then that is going to compare throughout the European Union. This is also called the Bologna process. Why Bologna? Because Bologna, which is not next to Bigfaya. Yeah, it's not that Bologna, right? <laughs> it's the other one, right? The, the one in Italy. 800 years ago, guys, 800 years ago, 
the first European university in a modern sense of university, which means not, it wasn't a school of theology. It was a university with philosophy, with science, et cetera. The first modern university in human history founded in Bologna by students. What happened was that the sons, unfortunately there were no daughters, the sons of merchants in Bologna, one of the important merchant cities in Italy in the Middle Ages, they got together and said, we need training. So they hired, instead of have, having a private tutor come to their house, they collected a whole bunch of tutors, put them in a big building and had a class situation. The university was run by the students. Can you imagine that happening at NDU? No. Talk about no daughters university, right? Okay, so that's not gonna work. Okay, so transformation. What would have to happen for there to be a transformation? The first thing we'd have to get over is the assumption that we're a family. We talked about that. That's paternalism, right? We're not a family. There are conflicts. What does Doug Hammerskjold say about conflicts? What does he say about them? Let's have a look. Get back to the reading. So, if this is the essence of international service, such service will expose us to conflicts. It will not permit us to live lazily under the protection of inherited and conventional ideas. Now, we're gonna be, we're gonna be confronted with this laziness again and again. Well, there's a concept called flow of success. If, who's better off? Somebody who from the very beginning of their life had to fight because their parents didn't have enough money or they had a disability or they had bad luck or they just weren't really, really talented. So they, they achieved a high level of performance but they had to fight every day to get there. Is that a good way to live your life? Or somebody who was really talented. I had a friend, he was good at every sport. We didn't, want to, we didn't like to play with him because he, he, he tried a new sport. He was always good without even trying. That would be you, good. Now, the problem is that somebody who, at least be quiet when you're doing that, okay? Uh, the problem is that if you go from success to success without really having to try, can you close the door? Uh, without having to try, what don't you develop? You don't develop, you don't develop the ability, the skills to fight when adversity hits you. So who's better off? The person who goes through life in the flow of success or the person who experiences, constantly experiences sig, ne, Significant adversity. What's better for you? But is that what you want? Is that what you aspire to? I want to be hit every single day by a problem that almost knocks me off my feet. Nobody wants that, right. So, but what he's saying is that this is gonna to happen to you if you move out of the realm of national into the realm of international. This will happen to you in any business setting. The moment, and probably some of you have experienced this already, you, you're, you move into a setting where you have people from other countries. You have people from different parts of Lebanon, for that matter. And you notice now it's tough. How are we going to get along? We don't agree on a lot of things. So what he's saying is, this is actually a good thing. It will help you to exercise exercise Moral courage. He talks about moral courage. This concept is already in the reading. You need to exercise. And exercise has two meanings. What are the two meanings? We talked about this before. To exercise like in sports, to go out and jog every day. It also means to, to implement, to carry out. A, I'm exercising my responsibility as a teacher by teaching, by preparing, by doing uh, readings to be up on the current da data, but I'm also exercising in the sense that I'm in sports. Okay, so basically the flow, significant adversity enables you to exercise moral courage. So let's continue. 
You shouldn't be lazy. He's saying people should be, you shouldn't be lazy. Intellectually and morally, international service therefore requires us, requires courage to admit that you and those you represent are wrong. Now, which dilemma is that? Of the four paradigms, which dilemma is that? Admit that you and your organization are wrong. Loyalty versus truth. If you see that your organization is doing something wrong, we saw this recently, by the way, with Russia Today. Russia Today is a 24-7 English language news service, and several of the journalists on Russia Today resigned on camera. Why did they resign? They believe that the position taken by the Russian government is incorrect. So they, they said, I and my organization are wrong. This requires a lot of courage. So now let's, let's have a look at this. What is going to allow you to live this way on a regular basis? So the first skill that you need to do, the first thing that you have to decide to do not, not daily, but again and again, is to go out and throw yourself out of any success mode you might be in and to experience adversity. If things are going well for you, you're not doing it right. You know the old saying, no pain, yeah. no gain. If you're not living on the edge, you're wasting space. So always be on the edge. Business students, another way of expressing that is to be on the edge constantly is Kaizen. What is Kaizen? It's a Japanese word that doesn't mean constant. Does it mean constant improvement? I don't know. Kaizen is the, is the heart of the Japanese production system. You have three lights at a traffic sim. You have red, you have yellow, and you have green. If the production system, whether it's like car manufacturing or processing of uh, applications for insurance companies or whatever, when the institutional setup is running smoothly, it's on green. When it breaks down and it doesn't work at all, it's on red. When it's just about to break down, it's on yellow. Where do you want your institution to be constantly? Yellow. Why? Because if it's on green, you will be in the flow of success. If it's on yellow, it'll be, you'll be constantly putting it under pressure to, to be on green. And the moment it gets on green, what do you do? You speed up the <laughs> machine a little bit. You add more difficulty to make it go back on yellow. So you can stay on green for a while to rest. Then you put it back on yellow. That's, this is what it means by constant improvement constantly increasing the pressure so that this is how the Japanese corporations got where they are today. And they're being followed now by the South Koreans and hopefully someday by the Chinese. Okay. Uh, so what he's saying is that you have to exercise by putting yourself on the Kaizen experience. But what are some of the things you can do to actually maintain your knowledge of what is right and wrong and also keep up your good spirits. Let's have a look. He calls somebody who's arrived there, but he, he, he doesn't say you arrive there in the sense that you're there and you can't slip back. So one thing you should be aware of is that Hammerskjold does not agree with Kohlberg. Hammerskjold does not assume that there's no backsliding. He says he assumes that you're under constant danger of going backwards. By the way, just so you know, we'll be reading about this a little bit later on, but if you want to Google it, uh, the person who comes after Hammerskjold is James Rest. So if you want to go put James Rest in Wikipedia, um, James Rest uh, disagrees with the staircase. We'll, we'll be reading about him later on, and says there's always a possibility of going backwards. So Hammerskjold again says, so this would be a nice, nice test question. Is Hammerskjold more on the side of Kohlberg or rest? And why? Put that in your notes. 
<laughs> so why is he? He's obviously more on the side of rest, because rest says you can go back. Or you can be moral and immoral at the same time. You can be selectively moral and selectively immoral at the, in the same moment. OK, so <clears throat> maturity of mind is a concept that he developed. And it's the result of, if you will, permanent kaizen. Permanently putting yourself under pressure to compare your personal or national ethics to the world. Now, the world was divided in 55. Is it divided today? It's divided, but in a, in a, in a very, I would say, for me personally, growing up in the Cold War, a very confusing and unpleasant way. At least during the Cold War, it was very clear. We have the Russians, we have the Americans. We have communism, which claims to be for social justice. And we have capitalism, which has democracy, but requires constant competition. So people get poor and often have problems. So we have two systems, <coughs> both with strengths and weaknesses. And it's very clear, one or the other. Today, there's also a divided world. But it's not clearly divided into two camps. And the, the uh, agenda, the goal of the other side, okay, let's say the one side is obviously the US and the EU and their friends. But what is the other side's position? Well, who's on the other side? China, China Russia, 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 Iran, Syria, Venezuela. No, Brazil not on the other side. <laughs> but, but do those countries have a lot in common? They all they have, they have one common enemy. What happens, what, what's the problem with having a common enemy? Once he's gone. Once he's gone, then we all start fighting with each other. Uh, so another thing you should write down, these are like sort of things we'll be using again. What does BRICS stand for? Brazil, Russia, India, India, not Italy, China, and South Africa. What do these countries have in common? They're economically almost or more successful than the old centers, which would be the US, Canada, the European Union, Japan, Australia, New Zealand. Those are the old centers of prosperity and control globally. And these countries are now catching up or have surpassed. China is now the second most, um, second largest economy in the world. But what else do they have in common? Not much. Well, they're more than half the world's population. Right, OK. But they don't have, it's, it's, it's difficult for them to sit down and agree on something. And, and not all of them are on the other side. Which ones are on the other side? Russia and China. Other in the conflict, for example, Crimea. Who's obviously on the side of Putin? China. And then some smaller players like Iran or Venezuela. But South Africa, India, and Brazil tend towards the US. So the other side is not nearly as clear. So actually, what he's describing here is a world that was relatively simple. You guys are worse off. <laughs> Just to tell you, you're worse off than the people who lived 50 years ago or 60 years ago. So you need this more than they did. So maturity of mind. How do we, how do we, how do we acquire maturity of mind? That was on page 75. Let's move on. He gives us a test on page 24 or in the reading at 76. The first full paragraph. If you can turn to the reader, to the, the first full paragraph, in the world of today. Think about this. How much of this makes sense today? When you think about the world 60 days, 60 years ago. 60 years ago is a long time ago. When I was your age 60 years ago, that was, uh, say, 75 minus 60. That was 1915. I was living in 1975. 1915? When I was your age, it was 1975. Subtract 60. 1915. And I would have thought 1915, that's like the Middle Ages, right? So 1955, that's a long time ago. 
So has the world changed? Let's have a look. In the world of today, there is an urge to conformism, which sometimes makes people complain of a lack of loyalty in those who criticize the attitudes prevalent in their environment, which means people go along and are unwilling to uh, lack of loyalty for those attitudes prevalent, which means that people who don't go along are considered to be disloyal. So the trend is to conform, to go along, to do what the, everyone does, and those who don't are considered to be traitors. May I ask, who shows true loyalty to that environment, the world we're living in? Who's the, who's the true traitor and who's the true hero? One who before his conscious has arrived at a conclusion that something is wrong and in all sincerity gives voice to his criticism. What do we often call those people? Whistleblowers. Whistleblowers. Edward Snowden would do, be an example of that. Or the one who in self-protection closes his eyes to what is objectionable and shuts his lips on his criticism. He knows it's wrong. He buttons his lips. The concept of loyalty is distorted when it is understood to mean blind acceptance. It is correctly interpreted when it is assumed to cover honest criticism. So what is, what is your responsibility as a leader? To encourage your subordinates, the people who are under you, to speak up and criticize you. Now why would that be a good thing? I'm going to erase all this, so if anybody wants to write anything down, it's, you, all, you all got that, okay. Uh, why is it good, and what do whistleblowers have in common with criticism from below or from the outside with respect to civil society? Why, is it, why would people in power want people who are not in power to constantly criticize them? So, whistleblowers and civil society organizations have one thing in common. They're constantly complaining. And what do we call somebody who's constantly complaining? A, a pain in the rear, whatever, right? Uh, so, what's the good thing? Why would people in charge want this to happen? Good. Okay, I'll give you an example. This is one of those uh, English phrases that you have to know the background for. A canary in a coal mine. Does anybody know what that means? Okay. No. Okay. Uh, my background in mining uh, is in metal mining. But when we don't have a problem in metal mining, but you do have it in coal mining. Coal has a lot of gases. And the gases can explode, but they can also kill you because they're toxic. So historically, back in the 19th century, when people would go down in the mines, they would take a birdcage with a canary in it. And when the canary started acting crazy, what did you know? <laughs> Better get out, right? Because the, if the canary's gonna die, then you're gonna die soon too. So the canary in the coal mine function is like whistle blowing or cherry picking. English is a colorful language, right? So, the, the canary in the coal mine function of whistleblowers and CSOs is one, who said it to, to make you evaluate yourself? Someone said that in the back? To, to, yeah, to constantly force you to reflect on what you're doing because they're going to point out things that are wrong with your organization. So you, you should encourage dissent. You should encourage criticism. What do, maybe whistleblowers not as much, but what do CSOs, civil society organizations, do besides complaining? They try to solve the problem. And I think I mentioned this before. I mention it in every class because I'm active in this organization. Animals Lebanon. There's also Beta. Don't you can choose either one. I'm not gonna. The other one's Beta. No indirect advertising for the two competitors, right? Okay. Beta is Beirut for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, wonderful organization. I just happen to be part of the other one, Animals Lebanon. And what Animals Lebanon did was point out cruelty to animals, puppies and kittens. We all know that. What do you say about people who upload pictures of puppies and kittens on Facebook? 
They're stupid. Thank you. I constantly upload pictures of puppies and kittens on Facebook. <laughs> They're just my own puppies and kittens, okay? <laughs> so now I'm stupid. <laughs> so, so, that's what people associate with these organizations. But what about endangered species? In Lebanon, you have a lot of parrots. We had this on Facebook already. Lots of parrots, monkeys. The people who import illegally endangered species, they don't limit their activities to importing endangered species across borders illegally. They also export and import drugs and weapons and people. It's called human smuggling, it's often also called modern day slavery. So that's an important issue. And finally, the quality of your food is very much linked to what proper treatment of animals. Because if you're treating chickens, you know, you go to the, you go to the uh, store and you see free range eggs. Why are they more expensive? Yeah, the because the chicken's running around in the open space instead of being in a cage all its life. Which eggs taste better? Yeah. And they're more healthy, by the way, right? Et cetera, et cetera. Back in the 70s, they used to feed, before, when we still had fish in the ocean, when that problem was not uh, uh, was already solved, there are no more fish. When they used to take fish, grind them up, and feed them to the chickens. It was the cheapest way to produce eggs. It got so bad that the, the eggs were so cheap that basically they were almost free, but they tasted like fish. fish. I remember there was about four or five years in Austria where the eggs in the cheap stores, they really tasted like fish. So if you wanted to have a fish and egg dish, it was probably the right thing to do, but otherwise it was kind of weird. So whistleblowers, civil society organizations not only criticize, they develop alternative policies. For those of you who are going to be active in politics or NGOs, what's the best way to get a, a newspaper or any journalist to write what you want them to? To do what they want. Write the article for them, give it to them. What will they do if it's well written? They'll remove your name, put their name, get all the money and the glory, and you get nothing. Wrong. You get verbatim, word for word, exactly what you want in their newspaper, on their website. The same thing goes for civil society organizations. You draft a wonderful law and give it to the ministry, what's going to happen? They're going to use a lot, large parts of it. If we have the big challenge at the moment, we'll be dealing with this for the next couple of years in this class, if I continue to teach it, is the offshore oil and gas. What would the best thing be for civil society organizations to do with respect to the government when we're, when we're, when we're negotiating with the corporations for oil and gas exploration? Write the contracts yourself. Give them to the government. If they're good, what will the government do? They'll just use them, right? Because they're for free and they're good. So, so, so civil society organizations have a, and criticism on all levels is a really, really positive thing. So what he's saying here is that a conformist society actually makes your society weaker and less successful.